Let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and thank you for everybody who is gathered here today. And for those that aren't, pray that you would be with them and give your blessing to them. Uh, Lord, as we continue to delve into these parables that uh, Jesus spoke, uh, we we think about them and think about how unusual they are. And um, they, they may seem like a, a small thing, but Lord, there is a lot packed into the picture of, of what it is that Jesus is talking about and that understanding. And so give us the same ears to hear that Jesus demands of his disciples and of the crowd that uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open our ears and our eyes to the power of his word, and that that word would be in us, and um, that it would travel through us to others, through our words and through our actions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't have a lot of extra copies, so every copy that I have has been handed out. So you'll have to listen with your ears if you can't with your eyes. Last week we covered, um, so it's a series of parables that Jesus is telling. The big one was the parable of the sower, and Jesus interprets that one for his disciples and says, if you don't understand this one, you're not going to get the rest of them, so it's important to understand that parable. And then after that, there are four other short parables that Jesus tells, and those parables he does not interpret. And so it is sort of understood that you have the key to these parables because he helped you understand the parable of the sower. And that, that may or may not be the case. There still may be parts of it that are, are difficult or challenging, um, but we want to spend the time thinking about that and, and trying to unravel that. So the first parable that he told, we talked about last week, was this idea of taking a lamp and do you bring out a lamp just to cover it? And of course the answer is no, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and so you have a lamp in order for there to be light. So what, what is that about? And we said that um, Jesus is referred to as the light of the world, that he comes into the world uh, to shine. And then he talks about his own disciples uh, as being a light that would shine, that city on a hill. And so, so they're supposed to shine. And so um, the, the overall imagery of, of a lamp certainly does seem to remind us of, of Jesus and the, the good news that he brings. Uh, he doesn't specifically say in this one, as he will in some of the later ones, um, that the lamp is the kingdom. Uh, like the previous one, he did say the seed is the word of God. Here he doesn't, again, he doesn't define that. So it is a little bit open, but again, you try to interpret it based on what other things Jesus has said or done. And we said, well, again, the point here is he says a lamp isn't supposed to be hidden. It's supposed to be manifest. It's supposed to be light for everybody. So again, you look in the immediate context and both Jesus's family and the, the scribes are trying to hide Jesus. The family, quite literally, they want to get him out of there because they think he's crazy. And the scribes, through their own authority, are trying to deny Jesus's teaching and, and therefore in that way sort of, you know, shut, shut him up because you, you can't listen to this guy because he's, he's of Satan. Um, well, then, then that, that sort of does, does fit the, um, the, the picture there. Um, we also talked about how when we hide things, we do want them to stay hidden. You, you don't want other people to find out about this stuff. Um, but the overall picture of if Jesus is the light, God isn't, isn't obscuring Jesus from us. It's we ourselves, because of our sin, we are in darkness, and Jesus has come to bring the light. But ironically, some of the people don't want the light. They want to remain in darkness. So they're trying to uh, obscure what God wants to be light. And in the end, um, the light will win. Uh, go to Revelation, right? Where uh, in, in, that, in, in the new heavens and the new earth, there is no night um, for the Lamb of God, that is Jesus. He is the light and he will always shine, which again uh, is, is that symbolic picture of, of God is associated with light 
and Satan with darkness, and there will be no more darkness. There will be no more Satan. He is he is shut out. Pastor, did the, what is God's feelings about the scribes and, and the Pharisees? Uh, do we know anything about that? How how he were they holy? Uh, well, they should have been, but in, in their have. in their action, they're not. They're not. Yeah. I mean, they, they, yeah, to re to reject Jesus yeah. is is re you're rejecting God. Um, so, as we look at them yeah. from our our viewpoint, then they weren't holy people at all. No. Um, so in in the gospel, as Jesus gets to the end of his ministry, again this this isn't the first words out of his mouth. He spends a lot of time. Um, trying to still, you know, convince them. Remember when we talked about the unforgivable sin? Uh, he, he could have just condemned them all straight to hell, but he warns them, and like, the, the, this, this will not be good for you. Um, you, you, gotta, you gotta turn from that. But when he gets to the end of his ministry, um, so in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, uh, the heading for it is seven woes, and woe, W-O-E, is is a term of judgment to the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay. Um, so, so both of them, in the end, if, if you continue to oppose the kingdom of God, th there's judgment. Yeah. Th there, but, um, but, but note again, in his ministry, he's still giving a chance for repentance. And he, he doesn't just write them off forever, which right. we would want to do. Be like, what are you, what are you doing, oh, calling yeah, Jesus you're Satan? Him. You're, you're gonna kill him. Yeah, you're, you're out of bounds. They were out to please the Romans because the Romans had control over them, basically. Yeah, they, they weren't, they didn't really want to please the Romans. They wanted to use the Romans for their own advantage because they didn't like the Romans. They, they didn't want the Romans to continue to exert power over them. They wanted to be their own nation. Um, so they, they sometimes played, played the hands they could to try to use that authority to their advantage. Yeah, especially the chief, uh, chief priest. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The one that loved. Yeah, well, and, and again, they, they were in a position automatically of compromise because if they made the Romans upset, the Romans would depose them and put in somebody else. Um, yeah. Nothing's changed, has it? Uh, no, not really. You you play you play to the powers. You play to the powers um, that are there, um, or you not. It's not what you're supposed to do, but that's what what people do do. So so that's the first one. Um, so you see kind of what's what's happening there. Jesus has come, um, and right now it might seem like he's hidden. It may seem like it's secret, but Jesus says the light has come to be the light. And, and the light is going to shine. All right, so that gets us to the second parable, verse 24 and 25. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Okay. So there, there's, there's some of this that's kind of common sense. There's some of it that kind of ties into um, other things. So when I heard it, what I immediately thought of was um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, where Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure you see, uh, with the measure you use, it will be measured against you. Um, why do you uh, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, "Let me take the speck out of your eye," when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Um, so, so there he's he's obviously talking about. Uh, hypocrisy. He's talking about, you know, that people will immediately judge and condemn others for their sin. But again, he says, you're, you don't realize the big plank, the big log in your own eye. You, you write off your own sin. And certainly uh, that, that is always something that is the case for all of us, right? There, there are certain sins that we as Christians say, oh, those, those are the really bad ones. Um, and we condemn others for them. 
in, in our culture, you know, sexual sins are, are one of those hot button ones. Now, we, we do not condone them. We, you know, we cannot because the Bible calls them a sin, but we sometimes make them out to be like the worst of all sins. Um, and, and I, I think that's, that's a bad witness because again, all sin condemns and are, are we not guilty ourselves of, of sins, um, sins of pride, sins of ple our own pleasure, um, you know, sins of, of gossip. Uh, you know, we all commit different sins, but but some of those, you know, oh, it's it's okay. You know, we we, we these are the good sins. We allow them, and, and so Jesus there is is speaking against that kind of self righteousness. Um, so that's what I thought of, but I and I think that's true of Matthew seven, but I'm not sure that's what this little saying is about. So. The first words that he says are, pay attention to what you hear. And in the context of these parables, he said that a lot. He who has ears, let him hear. If you have ears to listen, you know, li listen up. And so Jesus really is drawing the focus on, on what it is to be a disciple, is to listen to Jesus. And so when he says, pay attention to what you hear, that does mean something for that immediate context. Jesus is the one speaking right now. So that's why you need to pay attention. You need to listen to Jesus. What other influences are out there? Well, the scribes and the Pharisees are out there. They're saying other things. And Jesus is saying, don't, don't listen to all of that stuff right now listen to me. And his words aren't just to the potential disciples. I think his words are also to some of the scribes and Pharisees that may be out in the audience of, you might hear what some of your fellow, you know, scribes or Pharisees are saying, and you might think that they have authority. And so you got to listen to them, but listen to me. So starting that parable out, pay attention to what you hear. Um, Matthew 7 is very clearly talking about judging other Christians. This, the, the focus of this is how do you listen to Jesus? How do you hear his words? Because that's the focus. Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So in the context of listening to Jesus, the way that you hear him will have something to do with how you are heard or seen. Um, and, and so it seems to me that the, the, the little kernel here is the way that you receive Jesus is going to have some supreme importance to how Jesus sees you. So it, it, it is sort of a word of judgment, possibly, but, but it also could be a word of great assurance. If you are listening to Jesus favorably, well, Jesus will view you favorably. So, so that's a very good thing to, to hear from Jesus. But if you're on the outside looking in and you write Jesus off, well, then this cuts both ways. This is a word of judgment to you. Um, Hebrews talks about the word of God being like a two-edged sword. And I think that's that's exactly the point. A sword could be an instrument of, of death and destruction, but it also could be an instrument that saves your life or the life of another person. And so it is for Jesus. He is, by definition, divisive. And you're going to fall on one of two sides. So Jesus' words are going to call for an action. There, there is no staying in the middle. You either believe him or, or you don't. And Jesus here, with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Now, again, on its own, that could mean a lot of things. But because it comes, pay attention to what you hear. I think you have to understand that it means something about Jesus and the one who is speaking. In today's life, especially, mm -hmm. 
I, I wonder what would this country be like if we listen to those students that are mm -hmm. half nuts, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My gosh, there'd be blood in the streets everywhere. Yep. Yeah, and and so it 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 is true of all that our ears hear. Um, we need to decide, kind of like you, you said, does that person have any authority? So they talk big. So they say something really um, strongly, or they think it's really important. But pay attention to what you hear. It, does that person have that? Our, I guess that gets to um, my our, our sermon last Sunday, the Bible reading from First John chapter four. Uh, John says, "Test the spirits." So. Yeah, you might have somebody who come in and say, oh, I'm a prophet from God. You got to listen to me. But John says, test the spirits. Test them against what? Against the word of God. Do they follow the word of God or are they trying to take you away? Um, and so there John was saying the ultimate thing by which, you know, we judge truth is the word of God. And Jesus is, I think, inviting people to, to hear that same thing. So, so you hear other voices but it is Jesus' voice that, that truly does matter. Um, and the reason why you know that isn't just because he says, with the measure you use, uh, it will be measured to you. The next line after that, and still more will be added to you. So Jesus' words could be both a, an assurance or a condemnation just on their own. With the measure you use, it'll be measured um, to you. But here, it's even more of a blessing. This is, this is meant to be a word of blessing. That's how Jesus wants his words to be received. Now, some people, again, they won't receive it as a blessing. Then for them, it will be a word of judgment. But to those who see Jesus as Lord and Savior, he doesn't just say, so I will receive you in that positive way. He says, still more will be added to you. And this reminds us of such words as seek first the kingdom of God and, and all other things will be added to you. Um, you may lose your life for the kingdom, but you will get back your life and so much more because you are part of the kingdom. Um, and so Jesus knows, as he has called his disciples, he called them to leave everything behind. Follow me. Drop, drop your nets. Drop, drop Matthew. Tr drop your your lifestyle as a tax collector. Follow me. And what's amazing in Mark's gospel is that they don't stop and say, "Well, is that a good idea or not?" They just follow <laughs> him. Why? Because with the measure they use, it will be measured to them. They they know that Jesus is not just a regular ordinary person. Um, they, they believe, they want to believe that he is the Messiah, the one who has come. And so, yes, it does look like they're making a big sacrifice. They're giving up their lifestyle. Here, Jesus says, but you know what? A lot more is going to be added to them. Yeah, look at the, young, the rich young man. Mm -hmm. Sell all you have, uh, give mm -hmm. away, to, and give it to the poor. Yeah. And, and, and it very well could be that in this life, you don't see that balancing out. You may not see the more being added, but Jesus gives us eternal life. He has a lot more time to fill up our ledgers um, with his blessings and the treasures of the kingdom. So I, I think this saying, although it first reminded me of Matthew 7, you, you can use those words in that context. You know, the, the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Judge not lest you be judged. Um, I don't think in this context, though, that's the application of that phrase. I think it's all about how do you hear or receive Jesus? If you receive him as he comes <laughs> positively and in faith, that's going to be really good for you. But if you're like the scribes and like his family that, that have rejected him, that's not going to be so good. Verse 25 then, For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Again, I think 
you have to understand verse 25 in light of the verse before it. That's, that's sort of how you get this. Um, because otherwise, this is sort of an enigma. What, what do you mean, to the one who has more will be given? We could think, oh, the rich just will get richer and, and the poor things will get worse. No, um, it, it has to do with the one who has, that is, Jesus, even more will be given to them. From the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The one who doesn't have Jesus, they may think they have other things, but even those things will be taken from them. So in that respect, this little short, short parable here, the saying of Jesus, reminds one a lot of the parable of the talents. Okay, in the parable of the talents, one gets, you know, one, one gets three, one gets five or five and ten. Um, I forget the exact enumeration, but um, one got some, one got a little bit more and one got a lot. And in that parable, the ones that got a lot, they they went and they used the parable, the money that their master gave, just as he told them to. To the one who just had the one, they didn't use it. They, they buried it. And the master comes back and is like, you could have at least brought it to the bank and got some interest <laughs> on, on it, but you didn't even do that. Um, and so it, it, in the end, it will be taken from them. And uh, in that parable, again, God has given us all many great blessings. And we are supposed to use those blessings for our creator's purpose. Well, we see a lot of people that don't do that. And the, the first step in not doing that is to reject God himself, to reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. Well, that's the equivalent of burying that talent because Jesus, we're, we're connecting all sorts of things. So follow along with you know, me as I try to you know, weave, weave all things together. So that's the parable of the talents. But Jesus in John 15 tells his disciples, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you're connected to me, you are going to bear much fruit. He doesn't tell them, go bear fruit. He just says, if you're connected to me, it's you will. Happen. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's an automatic because um, he gives those life and those blessings. But he says to those that don't bear fruit, that aren't connected to him, he says, they can do nothing. And so that's another way, I think, of saying this. Uh, if you aren't one who has properly received Jesus, you don't have anything, <laughs> really. But in the end, even what you think you have, it's going to be taken away in, in eternal judgment um, and condemnation. So um, the key to unlocking this is... I think it all ha it all hangs on the opening lines. Pay attention to what you hear, and in in the context, it's pay attention to Jesus. Mm -hmm. The way that you hear and receive Jesus will either mean a lot of good things, or it will mean judgment. And you might think that you have a lot, but you don't. But if you have Jesus, He says you you already do have. You have the only thing that's necessary. And even more is going to be given to you. But to the one who lacks Jesus, they might look around and say, oh, I don't lack anything. I have a lot. I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of power. I have a lot of money and influence. And Jesus says, it's all a mirage. That will be taken from you. Um, and, and you will face uh, judgment. So um, Jesus is divisive. And uh, it's important to, to pay attention to him. Divisive. Mm -hmm. Would you please explain that word? Divisive means that you can only be on one. It's either black or white, yes or no. Okay. You, can't, you can't look at Jesus and say, gee, I don't know. Because if you're doing that, then it's a no. You, you, you receive him for who he is or you don't. And if you don't, because on Judgment Day, there's two... There's two destinations. There's, there's heaven or, or there's hell. There's not a, well, let me think about it for, for a little bit more. Um, Jesus either receives us or he sends us away. However, if we have our salvation, mm -hmm. we're standing judgment day, 
God sees Jesus. Yes, yeah. So in the divide, we we are on the good side. We are on those that that inherit eternal life for the sake of Christ because we trust in Him and He has done everything necessary for Him. But Jesus is divisive because He's it's Him that there, there's, you're either on one side or the other. Yeah, the judge yeah. has to be black and white. Don't you? Right, right. I, I don't mean, when I say that Jesus is divisive, I don't mean that as a negative thing about Jesus. And the, um, the thief on the cross, you know, even at the later, last stage of your life, uh, you can be, uh, be saved. Yep, yep. And uh, again, that is always... God's desire um, that that He He is patient and and waits for us um, t- with that hope that we will come home. Then why are so many young people nowadays just not going to church? Not Par- so the parable of the sower. Yeah. That I, I, that that's the same question that the disciples would ask you. Like they're they're in, and they're like, why aren't more people yeah. in? Um, and so the parable sort of spoke of that. If an agnostic dies, then basically they said no to Jesus, right? Because they say, I'm just not sure. Well, if you're not sure, you're basically saying no. Well, y- yes, but I want to be careful with that, Stephanie, because, um, so, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, okay. to, for, for some, for, so, so it sort of d- does depend on what what's in the heart of that agnostic person, and only God can judge that. We we certainly can't. Okay. If I were speaking to somebody who was agnostic and like, well, I, I, I'm not sure. Again, look look to Jesus and what He has done for you and for all people, and and trust trust in that. Even if there are things that still you know you're not sure about or you have questions, look look to Him. Um, and he receives all who look to him. Okay. Um, okay. That's a big word, trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, we go through all our life never seeing Jesus or seeing mm-hmm. God, but hearing the word, you know, and mm-hmm. you got to trust somebody. Yeah. Well, we, we, we see Jesus at work, even if we don't see him himself. Yeah. Um, Pastor, when mm-hmm. you're asking the Lord to give you an answer Mm -hmm. is it true that if it's from the Lord that you'll get confirmations is that true um not necessarily I I mean some sometimes there is silence um and and it is it is in those times there there is there is a testing of our faith um but you know yeah when 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 Jesus says to to pray, he says pray and believe, um, and it isn't he doesn't say pray and wait wait for some kind of confirmation. Okay. So this so means- I mean yeah some sometimes I think we do receive that, but the fact that we wouldn't, I, I wouldn't take as a negative yeah. sign or or that you know well that was a bad prayer or God 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 didn't you know because. We have that assurance. God answers all prayers, but he does so, thy will be done. He, he does so in his way, and that's what I think throws us off sometimes because, well, that's not what I prayed for. Um, and we think, okay, God isn't listening to me. Well, he really is, but God has a bigger and better perspective, and he answers in, in what what we really, really needed, even though we think that's not what I needed, God. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when the thing that is given to us is is suffering or is something bad. So Paul in the thorn in the flesh, right? I prayed, I prayed, remove this thorn. And God's answer was, my grace is sufficient. That wasn't what Paul wanted to hear, um, but that was God's answer. And, and it was ultimately true. His, his grace is sufficient. So... Um, we have to trust in that word that he hears the prayers, he answers them. There isn't necessarily a guarantee of some kind of confirmation, and there isn't a guarantee that his answer will be one that we like, um, but it, it, we trust that it's always the right answer. Um, and in time, sometimes we learn and grow and see, oh, at the time I thought, I thought that was totally, God was doing the wrong thing. But but now in a different place I see that that was exactly the right thing.
not a yes or not a no, and maybe not right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep, mm-hmm. yep. All right, so that's parable number two. So it, it seems to have everything to do with how Jesus is seen. And again, that fits the context. We're seeing now a lot more division over Jesus. And, and Jesus is basically saying that, that that's going to happen. Um, but there's a blessing for those who have seen him the right way. And there's a word of judgment for those that haven't. So again, you, you can't be casual about this. You do need to see Jesus and say, okay, what am I going to do with him? Um, and the, the narrative of the gospel is driving you to that. The disciples follow him, but the family, the scribes, they're rejecting him. What are you going to do? What, what, which side are you going to fall on? That's Mark's gospel. He wants his readers to wrestle with that. Um, and so we should to this day as well. All right, so the third parable, uh, verses 26 and 29. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He, that is the one who sowed it, sows it, knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Okay, so this is interesting because one, he just told the story about the sower and this sounds eerily similar and yet there's some odd differences between them. Um, so in this one, he's not concerned about different outcomes. The parable of the sower, where it's some seeds here, some seeds there, some seeds that. So. That's what the parable of the sower was about. It was about the different outcomes. He can tell stories about farmers and seeds and try to make a different point. Um, You know, we we do that. You can have a a, a story and a different conclusion that you want to draw from it. And so you're going to tell the story a a, a little bit different. Um, Sometimes you've maybe you've you've heard there are like uh, dumb blonde jokes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if, if that's who you try to poke fun at, but you can rename the main character instead of being a dumb blonde to be a Norwegian, right? And, and so then, then you're poking fun at Norwegians. The, the, who the character is, is all about what kind of point you're trying to get or what audience you're, you're trying to, to get. So just the bare facts of, well, they're both stories about a sower sowing seed, uh, you you got to look into the details and, and what is different. So what is different in this is um, he scatters seed, the seed grows, and there's a harvest. Um, doesn't really talk about what kind of harvest, just, just the fact that there is a harvest. Instead, the, the, the middle part seems to be the part that's different. So both stories begin with scattering seed, both begin end with a, a, a harvest, well, in the middle here is the guy that sows the seed. Um, and in this parable, he's not called a sower. He's just a man. He's just a man who scatters seed. Um, and so that's interesting because he's almost unimportant to the story. There, there's just a guy. There's a guy who, who scatters seed. And, and yet he tells us some interesting things about this, this guy Um, He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. So there's nothing more that's said about this guy and his interaction with the seed once he scatters it. So it isn't he scatters it, he he tills the ground, he waters it. No, this guy, he just plants the seed and then he, he sleeps, he wakes up. He sleeps, he wakes up. And he doesn't really do anything else. And he wakes up one day, he's like, oh, there's a plant. Where did that come from? How did that happen? Um, he sounds kind of stupid, right? He, he sounds like this is the dumb blonde joke. And the, the guy here is, is the, dumb, the dummy. Um, well, duh, why? you plant a seed in order to get a plant, in order to get a harvest. Silly. Um, but Jesus is highlighting that this story is about how a seed grows 
it's not about how a farmer makes it grow. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just the seed in itself, it's going to grow. And so verse 28, though, kind of messes that up. Um, it, it doesn't say in verse 28 that the seed produces by itself. It says the earth produces by itself. So there's kind of this um, putting together the seed and the earth, the soil, kind of act as, as one unified thing. Once the seed is there, now it's, now it's the earth that does this, and the earth produces the, the soil, um, which is interesting because when you go back to the, the parable about the sower, um, this actually does happen, and it's really subtle. It talks about the sower scattering the seed, um, and then in, in the language, it talks about the seed and the soil together as producing an outcome. So, for instance, in the first, um, the first part of the parable, the seed and the soil together don't produce any outcome because the birds quickly grab the seed before it can do anything. In, in the second, the seed and the soil produce an outcome. The soil didn't, didn't have enough depth. And so the seed didn't take root fully enough. Um, and in the third, the seed and the soil, well, the soil also produced wheat, uh, not wheat, weeds, thorns, thistles, and that cut out the, the, the seed that was supposed to grow. So um, in the parable of the sower, actually, he does like bring together seed and soil. That's what's really important. Bob? This reminds me of something I heard a long time ago uh... They, they were in Egypt, and they mm -hmm. opened up a tomb, mm -hmm. and there was a bunch of seeds in mm -hmm. there, and to go along with this, mm -hmm. the seeds did not grow by themselves. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until they took those seeds and put them in the ground, right. and then it grew, right. and they had cotton. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, yeah, they, they still had uh, everything that they needed, but they did need soil in they order to need finally the soil grow. soil is God. Well, so that th th this is this is the question in the parable of the sower, the the seed is the word, and then he doesn't define the soils, but he says the seed that was in the soil that's this type of person, and the seed that was in this that's this. So it's it's the seed and the soil together that Jesus defined. So. The seed is the word of God, but I think what it tells me is that the word of God, yes, it does produce, but the seed needs people to actually do the thing that it's supposed to do. And again, this makes sense because the kingdom of God is for us, that the kingdom of God, if God just wanted to rule by himself he, he could have done that. Adam and Eve sinned. Well, forget this. It's, it's all over. Uh, I, I'm going to, Jesus says, I'm, me and the Father, we're just going to hang out with the Holy Spirit from now eternity and, and some of the angels too. Um, but that's not what God wants. His kingdom is for us. And so, yes, the word of God is the all important thing. But if the word isn't in us, it still doesn't produce what it is that God wanted. It, it doesn't give the harvest. And so I think that's, that's kind of a, a really important thing because yes, Bob, we do, as, as good Christians who read the Bible, like all glory and honor to God. He's the one who does all things. But God is saying, yes, but the word that does those things, it needs to take root in people. Um, and, and so... You, you, have to, you have to see that God's work isn't done until the word comes to people and then that, that it would grow. Um, if you accept God, you're going to grow. Well, and, and so here's, here's sort of now, try, let's, let's try to make this fit. So yes, the, the word of God is, is the seed, but in this parable, Jesus says it's the kingdom of God that's like this. And so the kingdom of God is this thing that it, it, 
it's scattered. The, the, word, the word is scattered, um, and it produces a harvest. But in the middle, a man rises and sleeps, gets up, goes to bed, gets up, goes to bed, doesn't really do anything, but the, the plant grows, the soil bears fruit. And I think that's like in, in all of us. Because Bob, just as you asked the question about like what, you know, what's wrong with the people on the outside, we, we should also say like, what an amazing thing that it grew in me. Amen. The, and that's Amen. sort of Jesus' point of the, the seed, when it has soil, it grows. John 15, if you're connected to me, you will bear fruit. And we don't know how. It isn't us. We didn't make that happen. Um, it isn't because we're special. It isn't because God, you know, you're the good ones and everybody else isn't. It's because that's what the seed does when it gets in the soil. It, it grows. And that's the natural thing that should happen. But why doesn't it always produce? That's the parable of the sower. Because sin tries to thwart God's purposes. But here, Jesus is emphasizing the good outcome. And it is the assurance that the seed will fall into the soil and it will bear fruit and it will produce a harvest. And you guys are out there trying to analyze it and figure it out of like, well, okay, I know, you know, again, with evangelism, sometimes we, we do want results. So what, what we need for evangelism to work is we need these kinds of people under these kinds of circumstances, you know, and we want to control everything. But this is saying you can't do that. The The word will grow. The, the seed will grow, but it has to be in soil. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? You just have to tell people about the gospel. You don't get to control the outcome. That's a frustrating thing as a pastor too, believe me. You don't get to control the outcome, but you are responsible for getting the word out and, and God will do the rest. Pastor, would you say then that the soul is the body of Christ, all of us? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the soil are, are all believers, um, which, yeah, is the same thing as the body of Christ. And I think about how I found out about Christ mm -hmm. because someone was faithful and told me. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's been going on for how many thousands? Mm -hmm. Over 2,000 years. Yeah, and so, and, and, and the Word is is doing the work. Um, the, the, the seed sprouts and grows. He doesn't know how. It produ the earth produces by itself. Um, and in Greek, the word, therefore, by itself is automate, which is where our word automatic, automatically comes from. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a word of Greek derivation. So, you know, we say sometimes like it's magic. Well, again, it's not magic. It's God's power at work but it, it does work. Um, and so Jesus, again, is saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. It, it just does this. And so he has come to proclaim the word, and now you start to understand why Jesus is going to all of these villages. Remember, he's up in Podunk, Galilee. This is not Jewish central. This is not uh, Jerusalem. Um, for Lutherans, this is not St. Louis, or this is not Germany. This is all, all of the outlying areas. And again, the disciples themselves, but especially those scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem, be like, if this guy was anybody, he would be in Jerusalem, because we all know that's where God is at work. That's, that's where the action is at. That's where the temple is. But Jesus' project is to sow the seed. And so he, is this, he has this itinerant ministry where he's going all over and he's planting seeds. Um, and, and again, as, as disciples of Jesus, we sort of fall, fall into this too, I think. Um, our whole life, if all these parables are kind of related, um, we, we shine the light. We don't know how many people come to know Jesus because of us, but you know, I, I know I'm 
I'm an odd case. Well, I'm an odd case. So <laughs> that's true. As, as a pastor, the people that I spend most of my time with are already Christians. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, this is why if, if you think of a pastor as an evangelist in the sense of you're the one that are going to like make new Christians, pastors are not really good at that. Um, you, you can have a pastor who you call as a missionary. Now that's very different. You're calling that pastor and say, pastor, we don't want you to take care of us. We're, we're already in, we'll, we'll get, you know, we'll get somebody else to take care of us. We're calling you so that you can go out. You, you go out and you make relationships with the people that don't know Jesus and, and you do that. And, and sometimes I think people think that that's what their pastors do. Um, and I, I would like to, but we also have a flock to tend. And if we don't tend the flock, if we don't care for the body of Christ, there, there will certainly be people that say, well, what, what good is it to be a Christian? Because once you become a Christian, then the pastor no longer cares about you. He's like, got you, you're in, now I'm going to go out and get another <laughs> one. Um, and so if you really want to be cared for, you, you got to be a non-Christian. So I, think I myself am here today mm -hmm. because of the influence of somebody else mm -hmm. or of many people yeah. from right. early childhood up until now. Mm -hmm. uh, I've listened to some and I've disregarded others. You yeah. Know? But somebody has influenced me along the way. Well, so the, what, what I wanted to get back to was, so I don't have a lot of people who come up to me and say, I became a Christian because of you. But I do have a lot of people who will say like, you know, I, I, I see Jesus in you when you do this or when you said this or like, you know, I, I really know that the Holy Spirit is at work because of, of this, that or the other thing. Um, and so there, there kind of is that affirmation and validation. But again, to, to Bob's point, you, you, when you live out in the world, you don't necessarily get that same validation. But this parable, I think, is saying you don't know what seeds you've planted yeah. and they do work. Yeah. Um, but, but it is, we feel defeated sometimes because you just don't get the, the affirmation. And so you think it doesn't, it, it's not working. Would it be fair to say that the magic mm -hmm. is the Holy Spirit? Oh, cer well, certainly. Our job is yeah. just to talk about Christ. Certainly, yeah. And then the Holy Spirit quickens those mm -hmm. people yep. if it's meant to be, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So in Romans, Paul says it is the gospel itself that is the power of God unto salvation. Um, the Holy Spirit, we, we understand the, the Holy Spirit works in that good news. The Holy Spirit works to open ears to bring us to faith. Um, so it's, it's all, it's all part of the game. Again, sometimes we're trying to slice it too thin and we say, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. It's God. It's the gospel. And that's where I think you, you, you get to the point of, well, it's the seed. No, it's the soil. And Jesus sort of mashes them all up together. And it's like, it's all of that. It's the Holy Spirit at work in the gospel. It's the gospel proclaimed to the people and them hearing and understanding. That's how it all comes together. Yeah, Dee. Well, that brings up something I've been thinking about. Yeah. <clears throat> we talked about the family wanting to pull them out of mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. But at some point, they must have gotten it. Yeah, yep. Because they accompany him mm -hmm. uh, in his last mm -hmm. uh, agony. And uh, in fact, in, in his pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the uh, Passover. Yep, yeah. And uh, Mary, especially James and Jude, who are, again, thought to be Jesus's brothers, they, they do become important leaders in the church after the resurrection. So um, they too may not have quite gotten it right away, but they did uh, in the end. Um, Another question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this seems to go on and on, this question. It's okay. Was, 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 did Mary have other children? Mm -hmm. uh, now, my own feeling mm -hmm. is that she married a widower. Mm -hmm who had children mm -hmm. and uh, they were all older than Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a conjecture. Oh, it's okay. possible that that's one way to account for, um, for again, 
in what we just read, it talked about his brothers and sisters, and so the the straightforward reading of that is that they that they were, and so the question is, well, how? And so yes, um, it is possible that Joseph had children in a previous marriage when he took Mary. The 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 gospels say nothing about it because, in a sense. The gospel wasn't about Mary and Joseph. Yes, they right. they don't really, you know, yeah. care care much. Um, so that's one option. The other option is that Mary and Joseph did have kids, and so those are younger siblings. Or the other option is that brother didn't really mean brother, sister didn't mean sister. It just meant relation, and so they were cousins or, you know, so, something else. Um, and one can believe any of those options that the gospel is not made or broken on on any of those things there there are details along the way um jesus said who is my brother yeah you are my brother the the again what i try to do is you, you try to try to not come with your own hypothesis or like oh i think it must be that but you try to make use of all of what we have and so one of the things that is is said of if mary um, if if Mary had other children, especially ones that were older, what we see happening at the cross when Mary is given to John, well, why would why would Jesus do that if there were other siblings to take care of uh, of her? If Jesus was the oldest sibling, it culturally it would have been his job to do that. Um, and so, who was there? Well. John was there, and, and he loved and trusted John, and so he, he felt comfortable doing that with John, whereas his other siblings weren't there. Um, but you could also say, well, whether they were siblings of a different marriage or younger siblings, the point could also have been that they didn't accept Jesus at that point in time, and he's not going to entrust his, his mom to, to somebody who wasn't a believer, whereas John was, um, Got a lot yeah, of you, 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 you end up in, in, in a lot of questions. So again, for us as Lutherans, it's not a doctrine of the church that we would take a lot of, you know, yeah. but in the, in Roman Catholicism, it, it does become a doctrine of the church because Mary's position in the church has some special significance that she doesn't have in other branches of Christianity. So, um, as a Lutheran, I say it doesn't really matter, but if, if you're Catholic, you have to get the Pope's permission to say the same thing because he may not uh, agree with you there. Um, okay, I, I, we just have a couple more minutes. So one other small thing. So the as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Um, again, in the parable of the sower, it seems clear that Jesus is identified as the sower, even though he never says that, because in the gospel, he's the one who's proclaiming the word uh, of the kingdom. So here, it's interesting when he says, a man, when you might remember, he refers to himself as the a son of man, the son of man. Um, and so, again, it, it, he, he does kind of put himself in the driver's seat. But I did read some things where it says, well, it sounds really odd to say if, again, if you focus on the one scattering the seed, um, Jesus sleeps and rises night and day and doesn't know what's going on. That, that, that doesn't seem like a very good way to describe Jesus because he did know exactly what's going on. Um, so you do always have to be careful of... Sometimes details are significant and sometimes they aren't. Maybe who this man is really isn't significant at all. The point is the seed just gets planted and it grows. And he takes it for granted, maybe. Well, but again, but Jesus doesn't do that, do that because he knows exactly what he's doing and he mm -hmm. knows exactly what is at work here. Um, instead, let's not... Let's not focus on some really small details. The point is, seed is sown and there is a harvest. Mm -hmm. In Jesus's ministry, we can get distracted by, well, this doesn't look like it's going well. Well, this was a good development. The seed's going to get scattered and there's going to be a harvest at the end. That's the important thing. And we all 
are a part of that harvest. The seed has been at work. All right, I think we're at the end of our time. Any last thoughts, questions? You're on your way up. Yep. So we finished now three of the parables. Next week, we'll get the last one. That's the parable of the mustard seed. Of these, that's probably the most memorable one to you. Um, is that true? It's the smallest seed that, that is? I can't answer that because you won't come back next week if you know the oh. answer. <laughs> it's hanging. It's, you stinker. It, that, I will tell you that um, when... Uh, when my grandpa knew that I wanted to be a pastor and was, was still like in high school and college, that was always one of the things that he asked. Is like, right? I, I don't know if it, what the hang up is, but like, is the mustard seed really the smallest? Like there has to be smaller <laughs> seeds. And it's like, was he a farmer too? Uh, no, he wasn't. He was a woodworker, but he, he did have gardens and, yeah. and all of that. But it's like, well, grandpa, I, whether it is or not, I don't think that itself is the point of the parable. Um, I think it's something's really, really small and it's going to become really, really big. And like you see all automatically how that connects to the kingdom of God. And Billy Graham was a little tiny baby and look what he turned out to be. Yeah. 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 That spore is smaller, but I don't think it qualifies as a seed. Right. right. And uh, again, we're, we're, we're parsing things that I don't think were yeah. meant to be right. parsed. Um, we're, we're splitting hairs. Yeah. All right. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and uh, for the opportunity that we did have to look at these parables and uh, to see in them uh, a lot of interesting things, to see the assurances that you give us of the harvest, knowing that the word of God produces that harvest and, and does so in us. And you promise, Lord, that you will keep us um, in faith until the day of, of completion, until the day of Jesus' return, you do assure us, Lord, that as we look to you in faith, that so you will receive us in love and in grace and mercy. And uh, Lord, we, we take great comfort in these parables. We take great comfort in the words of Jesus, the word of God. And we ask, Lord, that uh, as we have been comforted by them, again, use us. Use us to be your instruments so that this word would continue to grow in other people. And Lord, yes, we don't always see the growth. We don't always know it or understand it. But we trust in your great promise here that, that we, we can go to bed and we can wake up. We may not understand it, but your word is alive in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.